Hello and welcome to episode 32 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we are back with another and final installment of the Muscle Group series. In this series, we take a deep dive on specific muscles each and every episode. You'll learn the function of the muscle, common training mistakes, misconceptions about that muscle group, go-to exercises, and why we program them for clients. We'll also touch on key execution cues to nail down your technique. And without further ado, in today's episode, we're going to be covering the abdominals and the calves. So a two for one. And I always like to note on the front end of these muscle group series episodes that we are not here to exhaust these explanations. We're not here to exhaust these anatomical structures, talk too deeply about them, get too nitty gritty with them. What we are here to do is to give you the tools for a better understanding of the anatomy to apply that to your training sessions, right? A real world application of this information. Okay, so I just like to preface all of that uh, before we hop into the episode. And before we start, we've been doing this new segment, we've been loving it, um, just to appreciate everyone who has been leaving a review on Apple iTunes or Apple iTunes, Apple Podcasts, um, <laughs> showing my age here uh, on Apple Podcasts. Uh, and today's review is from Alex Brown. And they said, smartest in the biz, these guys should be running a health and fitness masterclass. Uh, thank you, Alex. And that's kind of what this podcast is, I guess, uh, if you could say that kind, kind of. of, it's a free masterclass on all things yeah. getting strong and jacked. Um, so thank you so much. We do appreciate uh, those reviews. They go so, so far for us uh, here at Seek Development for the podcast and helping uh, the podcast be found by others uh, to join in on the fun, on the masterclass. So if you would like us to read <laughs> your review on the podcast, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you guys have any questions and you're watching this on YouTube or you would like to watch this on YouTube, there are video podcasts as well. You can leave the question below that video. We'll go retrieve it and we'll answer it on the podcast. Okay, so without further ado, We'll get right into today's episode. I'll pass it off to Alex, and he's going to start us off with the abdominals. All right. The abdominals, the, the muscle group that we all desire to always have 365 days a year. Um, and unfortunately for most, it does not, uh, it does not show it itself well. 365 <laughs> yeah. days yeah. a year. <laughs> that hope does not come true. Uh, but it is the, uh, the main muscles responsible in terms of utilizing the abdomen is going to be the rectus abdominis. So this is going to be what is visual for you to see that six pack or for those genetically gifted, potentially seeing an eight pack of just beautifully stacked blocks, uh, through your midsection. The, uh, also, you're going to see on the sides of the body, you're going to have the external, and then what's going to reside under that is the internal oblique. So you have your external and internal obliques, the, uh, the portions of the muscle that kind of run at a 45 degree angle for uh, a large portion of, of individuals on the sides of their uh, midsection. And then there is also the transverse abdominis or the TVA, which is going to reside under or kind of behind the rectus abdominis. This is going to be an extremely important muscle group that is just not often trained. And we're going to see the TVA's importance uh, even greater uh, more, yes, greater, greater more <laughs> within uh, during pregnancy for, for women. This is going to be a muscle group that is painfully, painfully important. And this is something that we drive home with a lot of our clients or all of our clients who go through their pregnancies and, and after, uh, during postpartum is that this is a muscle group that we need to train very extensively. So when we look at coming back to the rectus abdominis, this is going to be a larger, uh, muscle group as a whole. It's going to attach at the sternum and then is going to run alongside the the ribs as as well and then come all the way down and and correct me here if i'm i'm wrong austin but it is going to make its uh insertion onto the the pelvis yeah okay so within that um obviously this is going to have a lot of control within the the crunching this makes sense for you when we are utilizing the the rectus abdominis is that we are wanting to bring that sternum and get it as close as possible to that pelvis so that we're creating that that shortening effect as well as getting them as as far apart to create that lengthening aspect of training them through that full contraction 
Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. We have a video on YouTube that illustrates that point really well. Um, so the cable, we'll talk more about exercises here in a minute, but the cable rope crunch uh, video on our YouTube channel, just search physique development rope crunch, uh, it'll come right up. And that talks about, it's basically me going through that movement, but it's me talking about what Alex just touched on, which is that spinal flexion component of the the what that rectus abdominis muscle does and how we're instead of moving to point A to point B in the movement, we're really thinking about bringing that sternum down to the pelvis and utilizing that tissue, you know, rather than just worrying about locations. Right. Uh, and, and the rectus abdominis is going to also, uh, play a huge role in just overall stabilization within your body. If we're not creating quality tension through the abdomen, uh, through a lot of our movements, through the squat and through the deadlift, this is going to put our body in a very compromised position. And we're probably going to, to dig into that as well. Um, but your abs and your obliques are going to play a role in literally every movement that you're going to perform from an exercising perspective, whether it be rotational, which is going to involve a greater portion um, or a greater percentage, I should say, of the uh, obliques. So that's what's going to be handling a, a lot of your movement um, in a rotational fashion is going to be the uh, obliques themselves. Uh, the rectus abdominis is still going to be involved there, but you're going to have a greater involvement to the obliques. Um, so as some individuals who have maybe had injuries to where they've strained an oblique or they've strained uh, an ab, they realize, oh my gosh, this is all day. I'm realizing this discomfort from the moment I wake up to when I'm getting out of bed and then I'm realizing it as I'm breathing throughout the day, those different factors. And anybody who's potentially uh, strained a rib or something like that, very similar kind of like, man, this is a, this is a crummy injury to have and it really hinders you throughout the day. So that's going to be kind of indicative if you've experienced that to how much involvement the the abs and the obliques specifically uh, and the TVA are, are going to play a role in just your day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Yeah. I think mu any muscle is like that too. It's like uh, I've had, I had a client who injured his hamstring recently playing uh, flag football. And we had to really alter his training because one, obviously there's so, there's so much that the hamstring does, which we talked about in episode 26. Uh, if you want to go back and listen to that, um, it's another muscle group series episode, but uh, it's the same goes, you know, you sort of, the point of bringing that up was you sort of realize how much these muscle groups play a role in your everyday life, not just moving load in the gym, right? So especially these muscles that control breathing and, and respiration and um, all of these things that, that help uh, rotate and, and flex the spine and the torso and, and control our everyday movement, uh, sitting up, you know, sitting down, standing up, all of these things, it's pretty wild. So uh, the health of this tissue is paramount. And the health of this tissue is something that we want to really prioritize. And so we know that to be healthy tissue, we need to make that strong and resilient, right? Which is comes down to training this tissue. Well, uh, just like we do all their muscle groups and the abs are no different than any other muscle, uh, and how they, they contract, they, they, they build, they hypertrophy, um, they do all of those things, right? So we need to train them very strategically with good technique and place that load, uh, where we want it to go. And, um, take care of that tissue and build resilience and, and strength there um, to help control these functions and, and keep it healthy. Yeah. And I think that before we get into the exercises for you guys, the, the last note that I would like to make uh, pertaining to the TVA, you can think of this as your, uh, your own lifting belt. So strengthening the TVA is going to serve as more of a bracing mechanism through a lot of these exercises that we spoke to, the, the, the deadlift, the, the back squat, those different factors. This is going to be a huge proponent for you um, and something that we, like I said, work on it very specifically within our, our clients who are going through pregnancy or postpartum, um, but even, you know, greater for the individuals who are uh, potentially going into like powerlifting meets or individuals who are wanting to, you know, have very heavy loading within their just training in general. This is going to be a very important piece of the puzzle to have quality strength in because injuries that, that transpire by having a weak TVA are, are very challenging to come back from and then take a very long period of time, whether that be injuring your, your back of sorts, um, and, and those different factors. I mean, that's going to be a long recovery period that you're outside of the gym, um, and you know, losing your gains, if you will. 
Yeah, and I think too, even if you're able to stay in the gym and not not get injured, I remember when I was first really introduced to the the importance of the TVA in just normal training and in your ability to create tension, right? Um, especially in like back movements and, and things like that, um, you know, let alone the, the bigger compound movements like the squat and the deadlift that we were talking about earlier, but even like pull downs and, and you know, rope pullovers with a cable and like all those things like to, to have and maintain that rigid torso position that's needed to create the right stability and, and create a lot of tension, which we talked so much about on the podcast, that becomes so, so crucial and it becomes irreplaceable when it comes to, you know, when it comes down to exercise technique and creating tension, right? Which is, we know tension is our, you know, it's our hundred dollar bill in terms of currency when it comes to muscle growth. So it's like, we need that big bill to, to, to deposit, right? We need, we need to pay with those big bills, um, and make a good, to keep with the analogy here to kind of keep paying towards that end goal, um, in that bank account virtually with muscle growth, right? So, um, it's very, very important. So yeah, TVA is huge, uh, not only in re- building strength and, and injury prevention, but also the creation itself of tension um, and maintaining rigid torso position and a safe spine. And and again, that's going to work. Right at the TVA, if you look at, if you go online and look at, um, we have an article on our website as well about, all about the TVA uh, and its, its role and importance. Um, so you can go to uh, search physique, probably just Google physique development, TVA or transverse abdominis. Uh, that article should pop up. But also, if you just want to Google transverse abdominis or TVA muscle, uh, you'll see how interconnected all of these muscles are, right? Um, and how, and also in my book, in the ab section, in science of strength training, in the ab section of chapter two, you can see how all these muscles function. And it's pretty crazy how all, how they all function and work together and which ones connect to which ones and which ones are really relying on the other one. And, and so it's, it's important to, and as we get into these exercises here coming next, it's, it's really important to train these muscles strategically, um, with choosing the right exercises, right? It's not just about, you know, we, we, we go through all this trouble about having a variety of exercise selection. We go through all this trouble about, you know, lining up the resistance with the right muscle tissue when it comes to other muscle groups. And that's, that has to be reciprocated with, with ab training, right? So very important. And I think that understanding the TVA and the overall involvement has catapulted you and I, you and I's both lat training as a whole. Like I, I truthfully, I didn't have lats prior to understanding yeah. this. And this was a, a catapult to now me having, you know, some reflection of lats and also for the ladies who are listening as well as, as men, of course, but, uh, it's going to do a lot for your glute training, uh, as a whole as well, where you're going to be able to stabilize the pelvis to a greater degree with that strength, which is going to put your glutes in a much more, uh, advantageous position to really train and, and grow. Um, so lots of positives here. Vis-a-vis train your abs. Um, very, very important. Very, very important. And So we'll kind of get into exercises here. So what exercises to use? And, you know, like this segment always is with the the muscle group series, it's it's challenging because we can't visually show you kind of what we're meaning, but we can at least talk about it and send you to the right places, right? So on our YouTube channel, we have, and we'll have a playlist on there um, with all the app movements that we have on our YouTube channel. And we're continuously adding to that, um, adding to our playlists on YouTube more and more. And so, um, things like the rope cable crunch, right? So looking at a rope cable crunch, it's probably a movement you're familiar with to some degree. Uh, you at least seen people do it in the gym. Uh, and again, we're looking at training that, that six pack muscle, that rectus abdominis muscle, um, creating, contributing not only to the structural support of that, but also training within that flexion component of that spine, right? Bringing that sternum down to the pelvis. And this is a great movement. The rope cable crunch is to, to do that, right? We can line up, we can get into a kneeling position and we can literally load a spinal flexion based movement. We can load the movement that has us literally extending at the spine to lengthen that tissue and then to crunch down and bring that sternum down to our pelvis 
while contracting that rectus abdominis really hard while being loaded in the right angle from the cable. So it's really, it's really cool because you couldn't do that with a dumbbell, right? You need a cable for that. So, um, and it really couldn't, it'd be really hard to do it with any machine even. So, um, you know, there's some machines that kind of do it right. That crunch machine. That's like debatable if it's as good as it should be, or it's going to line up for everyone as good as it should. Right. And that's, that's the challenging thing about machines, but with that cable, right. You can set the right height to the cable, the right angles, to the cable, and you can, you can crunch really well, um, to train that rectus abdominis. I agree. It's really, I, I think that that movement alone, uh, could handle a great majority of the overall volume that you're placing on, on the abs themselves. I think that, uh, in terms of direct work, you can get a whole lot of bang for your buck in that sp- uh, singular movement and kind of move into some of the more oblique focused or, or TVA focused movements and just leave that by itself. And a lot of the, the programming that I write specifically, that's really the, the main movement that I'm going to utilize. And I think that individuals performing that movement, they feel as though it's going to make their waist blockier because of the, the loading component of it or the weight bearing aspect. Um, and that is, not inherently true. Of course, there's going to be uh, some potential outliers who are able to create such densification to the ab tissue as a whole, but that's going to be a very small percentage of people, um, at least in, 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 in our experience. And within that, I think that having direct abdominal work is not going to, I, honestly, it's going to create greater control of the abdomen and greater appearance rather than creating this very bulky, dense look that some individuals feel as though if they train under a weight bearing, uh, component to their ab training, that's immediately going to happen just kind of overnight, just as if I was to do a lateral raise and all of a sudden just have massive medial delts. It's almost the same application. Yeah. And understand that volume dictates the result, right? So the volume of anything, right? The <clears throat> and volume is just a, a, a metric to explain the, the totality of work being done, right? So the amount of work being done, right? So the, the volume of your emails, right? It's a, like I had a high volume of emails today. I mean, it means a lot of emails came in or I sent a lot of emails out, right? It means you just did a lot of that thing, right? So is dictated, the result is dictated by the amount of volume of that work. So if you, you know, if you're rowing a barbell six days a week, you're probably going to have a jacked back, right? You're probably going to be huge, right? As far as your back goes, you're going to have really developed teres and rear delts and, and lats maybe, and, and rhomboids and traps. And like your upper back's probably going to be pretty big. Um, if you're rowing six days a week with a lot of volume, right? And that's pretty obvious, right? So if you're doing these crunches six days a week, um, you know, with drop sets and in whatever, whatever you're using, right. Um, understand that that's obviously going to play a role in how much these tissues are growing. But like Alex was saying, even hitting these muscle groups one, two times a week with movements that work really well, doesn't have to add a ton of bulk or, or size to the tissue. It just adds the, the needed neurological coordination and, and, sort of proprioceptive feedback that's needed to maintain stability and, and have some sort of sort of control and conscious control, right. And even subconscious control over these muscle groups. So being able to connect with your abdominal muscles is very important. Um, you know, down to, let's say you're moving, moving to a new apartment or moving to a new house. Like when you're picking up a box, it's nice to know that, okay, I, I have conscious control of my abdominals. I have conscious control of my TVA and my, my, my obliques, you know, as I'm carrying or picking up this box or carrying this awkward bookcase or bed or whatever you're doing, right? It's like in everyday life, it's very, very important um, that you're doing this and you're, and you're building strength in these, these tissues. So understand that volume is going to dictate how much is being done here and how much growth potential there is. So if you don't want to risk it, right? All right. Just train it one, one to two times a week, you know, two to three sets, you know, maybe six to 10 reps. And you're going to be in a pretty good spot to start to, to be in a good, you know, build that muscle group up from a standpoint of, of being able to connect to it at least, which is very good. Oblique. Cable connect. I, I we couldn't decide on who was going to say the next one. So <laughs> who's talking? Um, you know, the oblique cable crunch is a really interesting one, and we learned this from um, Coach Hassman in one. 
and it, it's been a cool one um, because you know usually so the obliques are, are are really responsible for lateral flexion, right? So bending over to the side or, or some sort of lateral based flexion. Um, so right, so uh, spinal flexion, just straight flexion, is us bringing that sternum down to the pelvis. Lateral flexion is us laterally doing that, right, in in a, in a certain angle. Um, usually to the side or kind of like to kind of like a 45 degree angle or something like that. Um, and this is a really interesting one because it's, it's programmed in, in the technique is kind of similar, uh, but setup comes really important here. Alex, do you have much to add to the setup component of this to kind of maximize it? Setup wise, I find that it, it is very specific uh, for the the individual one. It, it is going to play a big role in terms of overall flexibility. You're going to expose yourself quite quickly if you're not able to rotate properly or, or you have something going on in your lower back specifically. So this could be something where it's like, oh, we, we have other things to address. Um, but in terms of the the overall setup, I find that um, f- facing away from the, the cable, but also giving yourself enough of a gap more so to allow for that cable to come across your body has been the, the best. Now I have had athletes who are going to be facing that cable and then kind of going in that same arc of motion and having better tension that way. So I've had a kind of a a mixed bucket of of individuals who have had better experiences with both. Um, I I think the, the video that we provide on our YouTube is it, it is facing away from the cable. Is that correct? I can't remember. I can't remember if it's facing or facing away, but I know we'll be updating it very soon. So if you, yes, if you're we'll be updating to- that one soon. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that it's a movement in which you've got to kind of play with it a little bit from a, a, a individual perspective to find what feels the the best for you and kind of navigating through that understanding where the, um, what tissue you're trying to target in the anatomy of that is going to be kind of your base. And we've talked about those things today. Uh, but on, like once you have that understanding and understand kind of where the, the arc of motion that you're wanting to accomplish, it becomes a little bit easier in trying to get what's set up is going to be the absolute best for you. Yeah, exactly. It's well, good, you know, well yeah. said, good points. Um, thank you. Thank you. The next ones are, we're going to roll through those, um, but the decline crunch or other crunch variations, right? It's kind of like a lot like the rope cable crunch. We like the rope cable cl- crunch because it is so individualized to that person and, and to the angle at which the load's coming from and the resistance and all of that stuff. Um, but the decline crunch, like a normal crunch on a decline bench or something, or even a flat bench, you can work, work well through. Um, and other crunch variations are really good for training the, the rectus abdominis. So that six pack muscle as well. Um, and also the TVA, the TVA does have a, a small responsibility in spinal flexion. So as long as you have your breathing proper and, and you're sort of blowing out all your air and, and as you're crunching and like crunching your abs like that. Um, so we'll talk about in training mistakes, like breathing is a big thing. Um, so the crunch variations also have a component of your TVA in there as well. So, uh, kind of double dipping into that. And that, that's also what I was saying earlier that these muscles are very interconnected. Um, so, you know, if one's doing the major role in something, the other one may have a smaller role in that. And that's very common across the body. And we've talked about throughout the muscle series, muscle group series that, you know, we have these muscle groups that oftentimes aren't working in isolation and often are never working in isolation, right? They have muscles that are synergistic to them and they help them and assist them along the way throughout a range of motion. So another thing to add, so decline crunch and other crunch variations, uh, the dead bug, which is a very funny name for an exercise, but you'll kind of get the gist of it. If you go and go on YouTube and look at it, um, you're lying on your back and you sort of kind of look like a dead bug does, um, when they're on their back. So I do get the, the name, um, stir the pot. Uh, we have that exercise as well uh, on our YouTube channel. It's also, all these exercises are also in my book, Science of Strength Training. So if you have that, you can look in the app. All these muscles, or all these exercises are in that book. Um, also on our YouTube channel. And then, so stir the pot. That's using a BOSU ball or an exercise ball, um, kind of in a plank position, if you can visualize it. And you're kind of like stirring the pot, right? You're stirring the ball kind of with those, those forearms as you're maintaining your torso position, right? And it, it comes extremely challenging. You'll notice as soon as you put your arms or forearms even on the ball, like you're instantly sort of like shaking or trying to like not rotate or not fall off the ball, right? So before you even start to stir, right, just try to maintain a plank on an unstable surface and you'll quickly learn that that's a 
more difficult task than you think, think it is. Um, and then the next ones, uh, before we get into the training mistakes, the next ones are like a plank, right? So just a normal plank and like a hollow hold, which is sort of a, you're lying on your back and you're bringing your, your toes up and your arms up when they're straight above your head. And you're kind of just maintaining, imagine you're, you're lying in bed and you're sort of like trying to create momentum to get up, you know, where you kick your feet and your arms up, you're trying to get, you know, get yourself up out of a very plush bed. That's sort of what it is. And it may actually help you get out of bed. Who knows? Um, so training mistakes, Alex, let's dive into those. Yeah. Um, so with training mistakes, I think that the, the breathing, uh, component is, is one thing in which individuals struggle with. So one thing that we teach is that we are going to be, uh, pushing out the air as we're going through the the concentric uh, portion of the movement. So as we are are crunching, we're, we're blowing that air out to where when we get to the full point of, of contraction, we have blown out all of our air and that contraction is is very, very stout. Um, you will you will feel that. Uh, and then you're going to be kind of rebracing or almost filling that air back in as you're going through the eccentric portion of that movement specifically. And then you're kind of uh, reestablishing your uh, breath prior prior to going into the, uh, the next repetition. So that leads us into the, the second training mistake that many individuals will make is that they, they are going too quickly. And so within this uh, and, and how we've already spoken to the insertion and the origin of the, uh, different muscle groups that we're speaking to today, there's a lot of other muscles that can be involved here, uh, because of the moving parts and, and how interconnected, uh, our midsection is in general. And so what will happen is that if we're rushing through these movements, the, the lower back can play a, a large role in, in this, the hip flexors can play a very large role in this. If we're speaking to a movement such as like the uh, cable rope crunch that I mean the 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 biceps the lats the the rear delts there's a lot of other things if we're trying to rush through this and and kind of like bouncing through this where momentum can really play a large role um, that can be a problem so having a lot of control and and really focusing on on uh, contracting the tissue that we're wanting to train just as we are within every other muscle group but this is one where we have to have kind of an extra emphasis or an extra 10% of emphasis, um, to make it happen because of how other muscle groups can play such a large role. And you're not even aware. So something like the decline bench where you're like, man, my hip flexors, I'm getting all hip flexors here. I don't, I don't know what's going on. It's like, okay, one that the decline may be too great. That could be a part of it. And your abs are just not strong enough to really pull you into that position. That could very well be a piece of the puzzle and de decreasing the, the, the decline that you're experiencing could eliminate that, or you could just really be rushing yourself. Like if you feel yourself kind of go into, um, sp spinal flexion and you kind of push your, your hips up and you're like, all right, I'm going to do this crunch. And you kind of like heave yourself forward. That's a sign that we, <laughs> you're in a position, either you've got too heavy of a medicine ball that you're, you're trying to accomplish here, or, uh, you're just not, your abs are just physically not strong enough to get you out of that position. So you have to, to equate that and, and swallow your pride a little bit when you're selecting loads, uh, for the training abs. The, the final cue is, is one that we use with all of our movements and, and understanding that it's not just, uh, about going from point A to point B within your exercise, but more so how can we go through the full contraction and, and maintain tension if it's possible within the con, uh, the constraints of that singular movement, but can we maintain tension from the, the moment that we're in the, the lengthened position specifically within the exercise to the shortened range and through the mid range, how can we maintain quality tension? throughout the entirety of the movement um, and not just think about, okay, well, I, I went from point A to point B, the one repetition's done. How can I maximize the overall quality of this exercise? Yeah. Was there anything anything else we wanted to mention on abs there? Because we want to move on to calves next. No, I don't think so. I think that that was probably the most extensive we could have really touched on abs in general. I think so too. Yeah, that was very, very yeah. I, I'm going to applaud us on that one. Um the the calves all right moving on to the calves so kind of switching gears here um to those lower stumps of the leg um something alex and i have been striving for our whole lives and whole may life. get to someday and that is the calves right so the calves the main muscles that make up the calf are the gastrocnemius and soleus right you've probably heard of those if you're somewhat in the in the industry or or have gone through that 
uh, anatomy education. Uh, and the calf muscles, and most notably the gastrocnemius and soleus, because there are other muscles involved, but those are the main ones. Um, they mainly plantar flex, so point the toes down of the foot and ankle, right? So they're responsible, like if you're standing and lift your lift your leg up and you point that toe down, you'll feel that calf sort of light up and turn on, right? Um, and that's mainly what those muscles are there to do. And also resist the opposite of that, right? So that dor they were kind of resist dorsiflexion, which do a lot. Um, it not only assists the Achilles tendon in that motion, but also they do a lot for, um, well, I'm going to get to it next. So functionally, the calf muscle assists in knee flexion, right? So we talk a lot about knee flexion in the, the hamstrings episode, actually, uh, where we talk about how that calf does play a role in knee flexion. So flexing that knee. So again, if you're standing, you flex the knee in like a lying leg curl, like a seated leg curl, right? That's knee flexion. So if you're standing, you know, if you're just standing straight up um, and you lift that knee up or lift that heel to your butt, you're flexing that knee, right? And your calf through the first 15 or 20 degrees of that is actually playing a really big role in that. Your gastrocnemius is playing a, a massive role in lifting up and in flexing that knee right and assisting trying to assist that hamstring in that in that um that movement um and then also it plays an important role in knee stability right so if we're doing things like loaded carries right we don't think about our calves much when we do things like farmers carries or something like that but the knee is playing a big role in stabilizing or the ham or the calf sorry is doing a big job in, in helping stabilize the knee in that movement um, which is very, very important, right? So having strong, you know, you don't have to have these monstrous calves, but you at least need them to have some strength and be strong. And and uh, it's kind of like the cat or the the ab thing, right? So, you know, as most of us want to have, especially the men in here, I know some of the women even probably want to grow our calves a bit. Um, it's important that you do train them, right? Because you need to have some strength and, and again, neurological connection and coordination within those, those muscle groups. So they can play into stabilizing that knee and also they help stabilize the knee and other movements like the squat lunge variations deadlifts things like that right so um, very very important uh, when it comes to to calf training which again alex and i have been in pursuit of that since the early days doing our best you know well i don't i don't know if in my mind i've been doing my best <laughs> we're doing it i don't know if it's, we're doing our best we're doing something there is participation Right. If I was my own client, I'd be like, ah, this is participation award, much, much less than your best. Um, but I will add to the the component of, of just individuals wanting to grow this for bikini competitors, uh, really any, any competitors who are going to be in heels um, for their, their competition. This is going to be a very large component to your look as a whole. Um, and I know that not many people talk about it, but you're going to see at, that if you are not training your calves properly, and you have very well-developed hamstrings and, and quads and your glutes are in great positioning. And then you go from the knee down and you have kind of a peg leg and you're in heels that should put you into this beautiful presentation of, of plantar flexion where you have this slight just flexion transpiring within your uh, gastroc specifically. And you see that it really takes away from the look. Whereas if you just have a little bit of density there, because you're going to be in that slight degree of plantar flexion the entirety of your time on stage. So you're going to have that little bit of, of flexion already transpiring, but it's going to add so much to your look, especially if you're putting in so much time to have your hamstrings and your glutes into this great position. Um, and, and for figure athletes, when you hit your front, uh, front pose and you have these beautiful sweeping quads, and then you go down from the knee down and from the knee to the ankle and it's just kind of like this peg really takes away from your look so understanding that this is a big piece of the puzzle that you're kind of overlooking especially as you get to the national level and, and furthermore with the pros once the i mean this is a a big piece that we work with our our bikini pros on is that the density that's carried through those calves is very important to the overall presentation. And so understanding this is, is very important. And a lot of the things that we're going to talk about within the exercise selection and uh, execution are, are very important. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so in terms of, uh, that's also why, uh, Alex wears heels everywhere. So if you guys see Alex in public, yes, he's I, did, I just started yeah. that. I'm still working on it. Um, this is also to help our bikini and figure athletes pose. I feel like, you know, I should just take that over as well and, and really put on the suit. If and you're the real, 
coach you <laughs> claim to be. I mean, I think you should do that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it only, only makes sense. sense. So go to exercises. The, um, there are some obvious ones here, but there are some non obvious ones that I, I wanted to touch on because we not only use them within client programs, but also they can be, uh, advantageous to you, uh, within your programming, depending on how you like to work out. Um, so go to exercises, standing calf raise. We've all heard of that one, um, but does a great job at training the, the gastroc and also the soleus. Um, and the seated calf raise um, does a great job at training mainly the soleus through a larger range of motion, but also does train the gastroc, right? So um, through a smaller range of motion, but they're both still in there. And I think, you know, I know Alex and I have been taught throughout our schooling that because that knee is flexed, the gastroc has no role, right? It's out of the movement, which isn't true. Yeah. I've, I've, I think that I don't, I don't know how you came to that conclusion, but through practice for me in terms of application, it became very abundant that that in theory makes sense, but in terms of application does not work. Yeah, it doesn't work and it doesn't quite make sense to me because how would you completely remove something um, that is there and, and is responsible for a role of plantar flexion, right? Um, but also, um, we're in knee flexion. So when we're seated, we are flexing the knee, right? Which shortens the gastroc, um, just like you would when you're you're doing a lying leg curl or, or a, a ha seated hamstring curl, you know, and that's why your calves are in involved in that movement because you're flexing the knee, right? You're shortening the gastroc when you do that. And so... When you're in a seated position, your gastroc is flexed or your, yeah, your knee is flexed and your gastroc is just shortened in that position, right? So that doesn't mean it's not working or not involved. It's just probably one, it's already shortened and it, it's working through a shorter range of motion, um, as the, as a, as a muscle belly itself. But I, I do, you know, it's definitely still involved, um, especially when it comes to, uh, when it comes to knee stability, right? Cause yeah, I, I think that, uh within the uh within that positioning more so it, it has to be involved it's just going to be having it's working from a compromised position with it already being shortened is kind of for the listeners to to think about it is that it's just not in the most opportune position to work but it still is going to get some work in, in some capacity it's just in a more compromised position exactly right we you know alex and i really love this stuff so we probably went too into the weeds on that one but um it, it's it's important to know like it's still it's still there. It's still working. Right. And I, I think through vague infographics, a lot of times online, we can sort of be sent in the wrong direction in our, our way of thinking about it. So, um, not out of their intent, but just out of just not being able to articulate it maybe over that imagery or, or through the caption or whatever else. Right. So, um, just something to note. Um, other exercises that, uh, we really love, uh, one is the, the lying and seated leg curl. I think, Right. So typically you would perform this, um, the opposite of how we recommend you perform a normal lying and seated leg curl, right? So we normally tell you to, you know, go slow in the beginning of the rep and then accelerate and intensify that contraction while you're going through that curl motion. Right. Um, so don't launch from the beginning of a lying and or lying or seated hamstring or lying and seated leg curl for hamstrings, but for calves we actually maybe want to load up the weight a little heavier and launch out of that starting position, right? Because we're mainly looking to load that first 15, 20, 25 degrees of that movement and really maximize that, right? So, um, so yeah, it's kind of the opposite. So if you're on our YouTube channel and you're watching, <laughs> watching uh, Alex go through the, the line or seated, um, he did a great job on both those videos, the lying or seated hamstring curl. And he's talking, talking you through it. And he's kind of talking about, Hey, here in the beginning, you want to kind of go slow. And then we're going to accelerate into the contraction with when we're pri prioritizing calves, we kind of want to load it up a little bit more and actually do the opposite of that. We kind of want to launch, we kind of want to create momentum at the beginning, um, to really, you know, fire up those calves. Percent. It's it's a it's a great one. I think that uh, this kind of moves us into our next one of of it being on the leg press and it being more of a stiff knee option. Obviously, you're going to have a slight bend to the knee, but uh, it is going to be uh, slightly mimicking what you're doing in the standing calf, where you're going to have a greater propensity to train the gastroc. 
through a more intensive contraction. Um, but I, I really like the leg press as well. And it, it being one of the only ways I can train the calf at my home, um, I use it all the time because, you know, I train calves all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, once a month, it's great. And I, I think, um, <laughs> so I, I think too, I, I like the, the leg press calf raise the most from the standpoint of when the weight gets really heavy, I don't love all of that weight going through my spine in a standing calf raise, right? So in a standing calf raise, you kind of have those, those shoulder pads, um, that you have to sort of like squat up into position. And then you're kind of like going through the calf raise from there, but all of that load is sort of compressing the spine, right? Which isn't a huge deal, but like when the weight gets super heavy, that gets kind of uncomfortable. Um, and you get fatigued really quick. And then depending on the rest of your training, like let's say you squatted that day or deadlifted that day and your spine's already fatigued, like all the muscles around your spine are, and, and torso, um, from, from having to stabilize your spine to begin with, we're already kind of fatigued. Um, by the time you get to calves, you're probably pretty, pretty gassed. Um, and those, those stabilizing muscles around the spine and throughout the torso are probably pretty gassed. So, um, I, I really like in that situation to, to utilize the leg press uh, calf raise just because you don't have to deal with all that, uh, compressive force, um, on the spine. And then, um, the last one is uh, a little different than our, our norm, but things like jumping, running, climbing stairs, all of those things, um, train the calves and, and place stimulus on the calves that your calves may not be used to, right. But they are very functional and, um, very, I mean, very functional in terms of, of the way we use those muscle groups in everyday life, right? And how those muscle groups help, again, like we were talking about building resilient, strong abs for everyday life is important for, for maintaining health of the, the torso and the spine and not, you know, maybe tweaking something in your back because you, you have really weak abs. Um, you know, the, the stabilization around your knee and ankle and things like that, you know, rely heavily on the strength of your calves. So, um, it's nice to be able to kind of have some more dynamic based movements, um, because life isn't one controlled continuous rep, right? Life isn't continuous or controlled or, or predictable, right? So you may be put in a situation where you have to like jump or move or, um, move laterally or, or you know, climb stairs or something. Uh, and why I really wanted to bring up stairs is because I did stadiums, um, like three or four days back. And, um, my calves are traumatically sore. I can only imagine. I mean, traumatically sore. So, um, if you want to really kind of shake up your calf training, go run, go run some stadiums. Um, and you'll be in for a, a real treat. And I, I think if you can make that, and I, I remember too, cause like we used to do all those stadiums and sprints and like, we always used to be doing that stuff. And so, um, you know, I didn't think twice about it, but it's been years since I've actually ran stadiums or done anything like that. And yeah, closer to a decade for both of us, which is a sad thing to say. Yeah. They're traumatically sore, dude. Just my, my Lord. So, um, have that in mind. If you haven't done it in a long time, um, aerobically, obviously you may be in or out of shape, but understand that your calves are going to take a beating here. So, um, uh, maybe go easy the first go and then <laughs> ramp up your volume from there. Um, common training mistakes. You got, you got those Alex. Yes. Um, the, the first thing is going to be, uh, not having a control over your range of motion and, and understanding that you probably have a little bit more, uh, flexion that can transpire or more plantar flexion specifically when you are going through like a standing calf race. Cause oftentimes individuals will really shorten the range of motion and be like, I can do the whole stack on here. And it's like, if you're pushing that ankle forward and getting into that full f uh, flexion of, of the gastroc, specifically at the top of that, the likelihood that you're able to do the full stack on a standing calf is pretty slim. And if you are, you probably have, I mean, cows for, for your, your, I mean, massive calves at that point. Um, and then bouncing out of the bottom. So this is going to put a lot of strain on the Achilles specifically. A lot of the, just the tendons that are going to reside in your ankle um, are going to be uh, kind of beat up from this bouncing sensation as well as just displacing the tension that you're wanting to have on the soleus or the gastroc um, throughout the, the training or the movement itself. Um, and then not training this, the, these two kind of go 
uh, hand in hand is because this is a muscle group that often individuals are going to put at the end of their training sessions. So this gets skipped very frequently. And then it's like, all right, I'm going to correct all of my volume. And I'm going to do this all on Friday. I, this is my last training session. I skipped calves on Monday. I skipped calves on Wednesday. I'm going to do all of it today on Friday. And then when you're supposed to do it again that following Monday, you're like, oh man, I am still so fatigued and so sore. I can't do this. And so like then you're right now. So. <laughs> so you're in this like vicious cycle of like, well, I'm just going to keep doing all of this volume on Friday. Whereas understanding if we can, if we can have proper frequency and volume allocated to where you're not having this tremendous soreness, you're going to have better results as well as being able to handle a greater uh, degree of load per per set or per exercise comparatively of like, okay, I'm going to do 12 sets on Friday and hope to be recovered on Monday. Whereas if you did maybe four sets on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you're able to recover adequately from those and utilize a higher load, your growth is going to be better as well as once you get into a rhythm with doing something, it's just going to become a little bit more second nature as well. Whereas you get into this kind of routine of like, well, I'm going to do calves like once a month and you're, you're going to be frustrated one with the lack thereof of growth, as well as just this ridiculous soreness that you are going to experience probably for a, a week. And if I sound like I'm coming from a place of experience, it's because I yeah. am. <laughs> it's something that I have done, especially early on within training. It was something that I pushed off a ton and thought, you know what, I can just correct the volume by throwing it all in one session. And then it was just like, well, I'm sore for like two weeks and I, I just can't get into a rhythm. So if you can find your rhythm and just prioritize these small things, I know that it seems uh, monotonous and, and whatnot. There's not a whole lot of exercise selection or variance in terms of how to hit the tissue. It's very, you're just, you know, moving the ankle, it feels like, and, and you are, but you know, if you need to like gamify it and, and put yourself into a more enjoyable scenario within the training or putting it at the beginning of your training session, if it's not going to affect, um, your other volume uh, of, of stabilizing the knee or what have you, that's not a terrible idea to go ahead and do that. I know that for some of my athletes specifically, if I put their calf training at the front end of an upper body session, that's probably the, the greatest likelihood that they get that volume done comparatively to me putting it at the end of a lower body session where they've just destroyed their glutes, their hamstrings, their quads. And then they're like, okay, well, the calf training, yeah, I can probably skip this, you know? So I think that adjusting it to where you're like understanding yourself and being honest with yourself is going to be big anytime that you're writing program design for yourself. Yeah. I know where you fall short as a, as a, as a human, um, and as a lifter. Um, but you know, too, like you can, you know, just tricks, right. Trick yourself into doing it. Like you know that you may want to have your pre-workout kick in, you know, maybe start drinking your pre-workout. If you start drinking your pre-workout when you get to the gym, like while you're waiting for it to kick in, like start to, you know, if you're picking your music, playing on your phone, doing whatever you're doing, instead of just, you know, messing around, like train calves, then do it then. Um, and then also another mistake that I, we, you know, we see all the time and, and can play a big role into, just health of the the lower leg in general is not training that the tibialis anterior, right? Um, can really, which is the the shin muscle, right? So if you've ever driven for a long time or not had cruise control in your car, it's that muscle on the front of your shin that you feel like is falling off um, <laughs> that uh, becomes very sore. And you realize, oh, there's a muscle there uh, that, that brings my ankle up. Um, so, to switch from like the gas pedal to the brake pedal to the gas pedal to the brake pedal. I mean, that is a, that's a muscle that needs to be worked and trained. Right. And the stronger that, you know, it's kind of like the old, the old adage of like a super strong low back and weak abs can cause a problem or a super strong, ab, super strong abs and a super weak low back can cause problems. Same thing with like, you know, an a agonist antagonist muscle group, muscle groups that, that are, you know, in sync, work in synchronicity and work together, sort of work in harmony and help, opposed force it's important that those muscles are strong so yeah that's it for abs and calves i hope you guys enjoyed we kept it under an hour that is very cool so go, go us. us um so yeah if you guys have any questions on today's episode head over to our youtube channel uh leave it under this video um of the podcast and if you want to check out some of our other content, ask questions. We're answering questions all of the time. 
Um, we're in there every single day or every other day answering questions from comments. So um, if you guys have questions when you're when you're you know lurking around on our YouTube channel, first subscribe. Um, but secondly, don't be don't be a creep. Just subscribe. Um, while you're there lurking around and watching videos, learning, leave it, leave us a comment, leave us a question, and we'd love to we'd love to get to it. Um, and that's going to be it for us today. I don't know if Alex has anything. No, no, doesn't have anything. All right. That's it from us. See ya. Bye. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>